Hello, book two. Notice anything different? Mm -hmm. Do they notice anything different? Oh, we're probably still a little resentful. Are you? We have started our face trim. Shaggy eyebrows are a little more under control. Mustaches are a little more under control. This under fur here, a little more under control. Is our... Oh, that was a little belch. <laughs> belch a lot. No, that's not very ladylike. <laughs> this is our very first try. So it's a little bit uneven. It's a little bit ragged. But we'll get better as we go along. A face trim. Very first face trim of the muzzle hair. This was getting a little bit much. It was it was starting to get all over her food. It was starting to look uncomfortable. What is it, baby? What is supposed to go to? <laughs> Maybe it looks a little better. We shall see. I'll get better at it as I go along. Uh, oh, 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 oh. oh. Um, but anyway, hello, book two. <laughs> Welcome back to your daily penguin. This is our tour through my penguin classic wall book by book and author by author and our book today is another extremely well-known author we had one yesterday with Edgar Allan Poe today we have yet another extremely well-known American author this is F Scott Fitzgerald uh, this is was is pandering to uh, a Brad Pitt movie so it is uh, what have we got here can we make this look any better the curious case of Benjamin Button and other stories of the jazz age other jazz age stories uh, and it's got the, the little signal on there, you know, inspiration for a major motion picture. Uh, I guess it's natural that Penguin would repackage stuff for this. Uh, I'm not, I'm pretty sure this is a, 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 an anthology of two Fitzgerald short story collections, the first two short story collections, uh, Tales of the Jazz Age and Flappers and Philosophers. And it's, it's just those two with a new introduction. Uh, I don't particularly like this at all is it says underneath previously published as jazz age stories it should have stayed that it should have stayed that rather than throwing unbearable emphasis on one gimmicky short story and this these two collections are very early work some of this stuff is reworked from from Fitzgerald's days in college and some of it is reworked from his days in high school I mean, he, he never let go of an idea and and had an extremely high opinion of his ability to, to write so that it, it, he wasn't it wasn't brittly egotistical he, he could roll with the punches he could be a workman but nevertheless even once his debut novel this side of paradise sort of struck it had a really soft landing it was really well received and his publisher had the idea of coming out a few months later with a short story collection to sort of follow up on that keep his name on people's lips it was not received as well. That first short story collection was not received as well at all. Most critics thought it was a bad idea, a badly uneven, little glimmers of, of mature talent. And the reason for that is obvious, because it, a lot of it was very old. A lot of it was literally adolescent material. Um, and the, the second the second short story collection, the other one that's included in here, was uh, slightly better received, but uh, it, if you had been, Fitzgerald is, is uh, often characterized as a kind of frail neurotic. Uh, that image of him was largely the character assassination of Ernest Hemingway, as is so much else of the characterization of early and mid 20th century American literature. Almost all of it that we, know, that we look at today is the handiwork of Ernest Hemingway and his malice and his pettiness and his competitiveness and his jealousy. Uh, Fitzgerald actually wasn't. He was, he was uh, pretty tough character pretty pretty good at taking uh the rude and impersonal blows of fate he, he, almost to the to the point of seeming insensitive to them he was sensitive to them he paid attention but he uh was extremely acquainted with disappointment and with rolling with the punches because he was like uh edgar Allan poe a blackout alcoholic and we, we always think of Fitzgerald writing all of his novels and then going to Hollywood and burning out his talent there and not really doing much when he could have been writing other novels. And we always think of that as a longer third act than it really is. In reality, Fitzgerald died only four years older than Edgar Allan Poe died. They both died very young. Half the midway point of their life. Now, that's probably not true for Fitzgerald because as much as he was an alcoholic, he was much, much more of a tobacco addict. 
it was it was off the scale. Him, him and Robert Louis Stevenson were just off the scale. And visitors to both of them often came away. We have their letters. They often came away with the exact same impression, often stated in the exact same way, where they would say, I know that all you hear about from this fellow is the drinking, but it's the smoking that's going to kill him. He never stops. Uh, <laughs> one way or another, uh, w this collection, the, the, the two collections here, I mean, they include famous stories like A Diamond Big as the Ritz or Bernice Bob's Her Hair, but and, you know, that, or Benjamin Button, I guess, which is famous now. But if you, if you look at these stories, if you take the book off the shelf and actually read some of these things, oof. <laughs> some of them are not very good. Fitzgerald supported himself for his whole life by writing short stories. And he, at one time, for a long stretch of time in his career, commanded astronomical prices. One short story, which took him... <laughs> This part is not Ernest Hemingway character assassination. One short story would take him, I don't know, maybe an hour and 15 minutes at the typewriter. Maybe that. He'd get the idea. Often the idea was nowhere else. Often he wouldn't write down anything. Often he wouldn't really plot or plan. Just sort of counted on his talent being there when he called on it. And it almost always was. Even his purely mechanical, purely financial short stories, and there are a lot of them in here, uh, the, the ones in here that aren't uh, a maudlin 30-something author not wanting to let go of the first stories that he liked from when he was 16, the ones that aren't that are often in here uh, pure mercantilism. Even in those stories, you can still see why editors would pay for these things. They are unfailingly readable. Unfailingly, they keep you going. It's just... <sighs> It's just, and, and I'm not saying that, that the, the greater depths of a short story were beyond Fitzgerald. They weren't. He could, do, he could do really great short stories. It's just, usually he didn't allow himself the time. Usually it was just, well, you know, I'm relatively sober. I'm hungover. I have a long afternoon until I have to do something tonight. Why don't I write a short story? And there were many times where he thought, well, I could either not write a short story or I could write a short story in that span of time and get fifteen thousand dollars. Uh, so he often did, and the stories often show it. <laughs> There's a he has a great uh, great biographer and uh, bibliographer Matthew Brucoli, and Matthew Brucoli's book, this, some sort of epic grandeur, is in my opinion the best F. Scott Fitzgerald biography that's ever written, or I think that ever could be written. It's just the perfect combination of eloquence and beetling through the records. Uh, but Brucoli also did a collection called The Price Was High. This is a collection of a lot of the short stories that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote for money. And uh, Bucoli's a great commentator. He's there throughout, pointing out everything there is to point out about those stories. It's like that neighbor's dog again. It is. It's the neighbor's dog again. Hmm. Okay. I went, I went over, the last time that, that sound intruded on a video, I went over and found the dog without Frida so that he wouldn't be going nuts, and neither would she. And... Uh, I, I found him, and he was happy. He was barking out in the sun on the, on the patio on the back porch, but he was happy. Uh, so I sort of let it go. I sort of didn't act on it, because that's my main concern. Is this a miserable dog or not? And he wasn't. He wasn't miserable at all. Had only good things to say about his humans. <laughs> so, in that sense, if he's just barking for the heck of it, he's just barking at birds or the sun or the wind or the skies or whatever, that's fine. That's fine by me. He can do that. I'm not going to be inconvenienced. I was just... what I'll... I'll check on him again. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, uh, The Price Was High is a terrific volume. Those two volumes, some sort of epic grandeur, and uh, The Price Was High. But also, there's a big, fat Scribner volume of the collected stories of F. Scott Fitzgerald. I have a lot more than just this in it. And Penguin volumes will eventually include a lot more than this as well. Penguin has a few volumes of F. Scott Fitzgerald. But they don't have the biggie. <laughs> they don't have the Moby Dick. They don't have... F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote a great American novel. There is a tiny shelf of such novels that are there they're just not necessarily better than anything else that the their authors wrote not necessarily better than any of their contemporary works but nevertheless you don't get to decide these things and neither does uh the sheer on the page quality of the work the zeitgeist decides these things education schools academia readers just in general over the successive generations decide these things uh and you know fitzgerald would certainly have wanted to give that accolade to the beautiful and the damned for instance but it goes to the great gatsby 
It just does with this author. That's all there is to it. And that it's often against the author's will. I mean, if you if you talk to Hemingway about the old man in the sea, he, he would have said, he would have said, well, yeah, it's great because everything I did is great, but I've written greater works. But the zeitgeist speaks, and you know that's that's all there is to it. And uh, Penguin doesn't have the right to reprint The Great Gatsby until New Year's Day, 2021. On New Year's Day, 2021, that book goes into the common domain, and then they can they can print at last a Penguin classic of The Great Gatsby. Until then, no. Until then, nobody can. Uh, but. I forget, there, there are a couple of other books aside from these short stories that, that uh, have, of Fitzgerald, that have already fallen into public domain, and Penguin does those, but they'll do them all. Eventually, there'll be a whole shelf. And eventually, no matter what, there'll be a whole shelf of Penguin Hemingway as well. Um, I, your Penguin classic for today is, of course, a recommend. In a qualified kind of way, it's a recommend. This is a great author, but this is not great work. Uh, so if you're really interested in F. Scott Fitzgerald, if you want to read everything that he wrote, which is possible to do, easily possible to do, one summer we'll get that all done, uh, then you probably want to read these. Uh, it's, there's a small amount of arrogance hanging around. There was a small amount of arrogance around a lot of what of the literature that came out of this particular period. Uh, a small amount of arrogance in an author thinking that I don't have to do much to a story I wrote when I was 18 to make it worth your attention and money when you are in your 30s and so am I. That, there's a small amount of arrogance to that. And Fitzgerald had that, and that's what you're going to encounter in these two collections. Uh, not to say that there won't be stuff that's good. A Diamond as Big as the Ritz is, you know, revered, and justly so. If you read it, you will see why people love it. Uh, Bernice Bob's Her Hair has a certain aplomb. And when you read it, you will unfailingly notice that. It's not like it's been pumped up into something that it's not. It's just... It's just this, this isn't the... I mean, I'm sure I have other Fitzgerald. I'm sure I have the other Fitzgerald that Penguin does. Just this is... Your Penguin Classic recommendation today is muted, as, as a few of them have been. We haven't hit a Steve Squeal book in a while. And this is another case of that. This is something that's worth your time, but... Uh, <sighs> But maybe not ahead of a lot of other things. I mean, maybe not ahead of a lot of other things. At the, right at the time that these were being written, for instance, there was stuff being written that is probably more worth your time. The collected works of Dorothy Parker are much more worth your time than this volume. And Penguin does a fat Dorothy Parker. Someday they will do a fat F. Scott Fitzgerald that has all of the great Gatsby, maybe all of this side of paradise, all of the short stories, and selections from other works plus letters and whatnot, uh, that'd be a great day. <laughs> Portable F. Scott Fitzgerald would be a great day. Uh, and when that day comes, if we ever see that Penguin volume, I, the point I'm trying to make in this video is that if we see that volume, a lot of what's in this volume won't be represented and it won't be missed. So, <laughs> so that's your Penguin for today. It's an interesting volume. It's an interesting item. It's always fun to talk about Fitzgerald, but... Uh, entirely 100% worth your time. Uh, not, it's not a four-star recommendation, I guess, would be the way to put it. Uh, so we'll wrap this up, and we'll see what we encounter tomorrow. I'm not looking ahead. I'm not paying any attention to what's coming. So it's possible that tomorrow will be a Steve Squeal book. Uh, it's been a while since we had one. I, it's kind of, uh, kind of bleak to think that maybe we're looking forward to a whole week in which there isn't one. I'm not going to look ahead. I'm especially not going to look for those books. No, no, no. We're going to do all the things. So we'll, we'll wrap this up for today with F. Scott Fitzgerald, and we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, book two.